Hello, it's me, Richard Chain. What can I say? I live in the country now. It's just all going to be the countryside and bird song from now on. Welcome to another Richard Chain's Less Square Thick podcast with the amazing Katie Brand. Um, hey, we're looking to video series 12 of Richard Chain's Less Square Thick podcast, and you can help us by taking part in our Kickstarter campaign. Here's the u- URL. I don't know where to put it. Uh, and there's all sorts of amazing prizes, but we're mainly using it to introduce a second emergency questions book. It's emergency questions called Christmas Emergency Questions, especially for Christmas to help you get conversations going with your friends and family, which if this all goes to plan, will be ready and available for you to give as a gift gift at Christmas and be sent out to you before the big day. So um, this is what it might look like. That's a, uh, yeah. It's full of great emergency questions, uh, such as this one. Um, Do you think Santa and Mrs. Claus might just be staying together for the sake of the reindeers? It's a good question. Uh, Given elves are essentially the same as children, do you feel uncomfortable when when someone dresses up in a sexy elf costume? Uh, These are just from the inside cover. These aren't even actually in the book. What is the most embarrassing sleeping arrangements you've ever experienced at Christmas? Questions like those. I'm not going to read them all out on these links, because that would be insane. Then you'd have them all. But that's just a few of the choices... Um, it'll be, I know lots of you have been having lots of fun with the with the emergency questions book, which is still available at gofasterstrike.com slash EQ. A man in Edinburgh stopped me and came up to me and said, I have to thank you, I bought your book on the first Saturday, and that night it got me laid. So I don't know how he used it to do that, uh, but it's nice that my comedy is still getting someone laid. Um, <laughs> but uh, Anyway, let's sit back and enjoy Richard Hayes, this is the podcast with Katie Brand, my friends, Katie Brand, my fan friends. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Leicester Square Theatre. Please welcome a man who thinks that his car is secretly pining for its previous owner. It's Richard Herring! Yo, yo! What's up? Hello! What's up? Welcome to Richard Herring's Leicester Square Theatre podcast. But I was at the Air Guitar Championship the other day. With Jessica Knapp, its husband. <laughs> and he calls it uh, Rahula So I don't know if that's, that's going to catch on. Uh, so, uh, yeah, welcome to the show. Uh, I was doing a bit there from, uh, I did to the audience beforehand, mentioning about um, Oh Frig, I'm 50, which will be on at the Edinburgh Fringe as you're listening to this. Go to Pleasant's One. There are still some tickets left, apparently. That's why for tonight's show. That's what I've been hearing from the box office uh, today. The reviews, though, from the Edinburgh Fringe have been awesome. They've been really good so far. <laughs> I'm projecting forwards and just guessing on both those things, of course, because it's the past. I'm not even 50 yet, that's as, you, as I say this, but I will be by the time you, you hear it. Not you, in the, that's not, you're not that far away in the audience that I will have aged. We're not in a black hole. This isn't the final episode of Doctor Who. We're not, I think so. I think it's all been shit, Doctor Who. Uh, so, uh, it's for kids, isn't it? Grow up. Uh, so, um... <laughs> It's very, it's love, it's brilliant if you like Cybermen. Uh, and things that don't make sense. If you like those, it's good. Um, I've not eaten enough today, I should say, which I think will be. I'm, I've, I've been out uh, partying all weekend. As my mum turned 80 uh, yesterday, Barbara Herring, congratulations to her. Yeah, it's not that old, fucking hell. Uh, it's an old for someone from Cheddar. They usually, once a woman reaches 35, she's usually thrown in the, a well. <laughs> fear of being a witch um but so yeah so we've been out i've just been eating way too much and drinking way too much so i decided to go on a diet today which is a bad time to go on a diet isn't it because i'm just i'm going to be lightheaded and say a load of nonsense i don't know what's coming out of my head uh, i have to say uh, but uh, I, I thought turning 50 wasn't they did a little celebration for me at turning 50 on the on saturday and we had a meal and i thought being 50 i wasn't worried about it you know, like when i was 40 uh, i really kind of went through a massive midlife crisis breakdown behaving like an idiot doing all sorts of terrible things. You can read about it in my book, How Not to Grow Up, uh, available from the foyer. Uh, and uh, I thought it wasn't, I just thought it's not, I'm not worried about turning 50 because now I'm 50, I've actually got some fucking stuff to worry about. When I was, when I was 40, I had nothing on my plate, so to speak. So I'm going, oh, I'm turning 40, what will I do? Oh, now I'm 50, I've got responsibilities. I've got a family and, and 
it's moving house and so you know there's no time to worry about baby 50 but they had those little 50s you know you get now that they put on they throw little confetti 50s on the table made out of sort of foil and stuff and i did notice that i was turning those all the other way up so they said 20 uh, so i think i think maybe i'm maybe i'm going to be hit by a massive midlife crisis during possibly this uh, podcast we will see um so um anyway we're going to uh, crack straight on i think with this week's podcast uh, my guest this week is probably best known uh, for being the production assistant on Stakeout. That's why we're here tonight, isn't it? To see that. <laughs> Going to hear a lot of the behind the scenes series of behind the scenes se- secrets of uh, Stakeout, a show we all definitely remember <laughs> very fondly. <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, it's Katie Brown. Ladies and gentlemen, Katie Brown. <laughs> Come in. <laughs> Sit down. Make yourself a hug. Oh. Hello, I've forgotten about Stakeout. Had you? Yeah. You were the production assistant. I mean, yeah. that must have been a lot of responsibility. It was in a, peri- a really happy period of my life when I was working exclusively for Challenge TV. Right. <laughs> and uh, I, there were <laughs> in Maidstone, which yes. is a lovely part of the world. And I, um, sure is. I would drive to the Maidstone studios and do my production assistanting on yeah. various game shows. And uh, there was one game show I worked on where I was the question checker. And I was watching it on the link. You can watch these things being sh- being filmed on the link. Uh, and Eamon Holmes was the presenter, and you don't mess about with Eamon Holmes. And I, it was a multi multiple choice thing, and the contestant was about to win five grand. And it was a question about fashion. And uh, the question was, who pioneered the pirate look in the 1980s? And the four answers came up, and the woman went, uh, "Is B, Laura Ashley." <laughs> and, uh, and Eamon Holmes, without blinking, went, you've just won five grand. And I ran <laughs> from the production office down to the studio floor so fucking fast to say, I've got them the wrong way around on the computer and it should be Vivian Westwood. Uh, so that's my abiding memory. Thanks for bringing yeah, up that awful, nice. frightening memory. Was that stake? That wasn't stake out, though. Uh, I can't remember. No, I think Stakeout. There was one called Stakeout, followed yeah. by another game show immediately that was the same production team and they okay. just ran us all together right. uh, for costs. Yes. So yeah, I, that's my that is my top A one anecdote to yeah. begin any show with. So, <laughs> it's uh, good for that time. You must be asked about it all the time, so we'll move yeah. on. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> although you were telling you were you telling me about stage, you were, you were worked on a show where you were a runner for our next week's guest, Julian Clary. Do hang around if you can until uh, yes. next week uh, to, for that show. Uh, it should be worth it. But uh, I was a runner. Yes. Yeah. Uh, pretty much twenty years ago, for the to the day, I was. Uh, a work experience runner at the BBC for Julian Clary on his show All Rise for Julian Clary and one of my responsibilities as an 18 year old was to br- make sure he was um, you know had everything he needed in the dressing room and he was always incredibly nice to me always courteous but he did one thing that used to terrify me which is I would go and knock on the door and say can I get you anything uh, Mr Clary and he would say I'd like a cup of tea and a surprise. <laughs> it would just be like, I'm an 18-year-old girl from Buckinghamshire. I'm still technically a Christian. I have no idea what you buy Julian Clary when he wants a surprise. So I would just usually go for a Milky Way. Yeah. <laughs> that would probably work. That would probably do it. I have, you can I ask him later. He got me a beautiful brooch. Did he? Yeah. You should have worn it tonight. Where uh, is it? Have you lost it? No, well, I wouldn't say lost it. <laughs> it's somewhere in a very it's treasured... It's somewhere in a very special place. <laughs> You might, you might meet him in the dressing room. We'll see if you re- think he'll remember you. I think he will, because I was a nutty Christian, and right. uh, I remember saying I would pray for him. <laughs> <laughs> was that the surprise? Yeah. <laughs> and was his surprise going back, yes, you've cured me. Yeah. <laughs> and ruined my career. <laughs> no, I don't know if I was going to pray, out, pray anything out of him in that respect. I uh, just thought generally, you know, yeah. maybe just... Um, Needed a kind word. Well, I mean, there were so many people in show business that you yeah, have to yeah. pray for. Uh, so Let's do a list. <laughs> let's start. And he's not, he's, he's not really very high up on that list. Uh, so, yeah, well, let's talk about that a little bit. You've been, doing, you've been touring a show about your teenage christian dum. Yes. I was a Christian when I was a teenager. Or my parents, when your parents weren't Christians. So I kind of thought, we'd, I thought oh, we'll talk about this in your... It would turn out your parents are Christians and brought you up as a Christian, but you, no. you came to it on your own. I, I did when I was 13. I, I, the only thing that was sort of religious in my background was I went to a Roman Catholic convent school when I was very little. 
uh, and we didn't do any maths. We just did art and Jesus. <laughs> uh, that was all we did with the nuns. It was sort of pre-national curriculum. And um, the only really I think memory I have that I've still got is a set of rosary beads that I won from a girl in my class called Annabella in a competition to see how many conkers we could fit in our knickers. <laughs> <laughs> so that was the kind of Roman Catholic school it was. Uh, and uh, yeah, but I left there when I was little. And when, it, when I was 13, uh, it was much later, we moved house and everything. We didn't go to church. I went on holiday with some family friends who just joined this big evangelical church uh, and uh, I was a bit obsessed with it for the time that we were on holiday so I went to church with them when we got back and I had this big spiritual experience I had prayer I fell down on my back uh, I fell madly in love with the worship band leader and that was it <laughs> the next seven years that was right. it so it was quite a proper happy clappy yeah yeah and all that that entails oh, yes <laughs> uh, yeah I, uh, I prayed out a demon when yeah. I was uh, 15 out of a woman. I mean, wow. I can't. There's no independent verification, <laughs> but that's, for that period of the, the, we, that's what we all believed. It was yeah. true at the time, shall we say? The, the but how did that feel? So I read that you'd, you'd done that. So did, uh, you, did you really believe that you'd done it, and did she believe you'd done it? Uh, I think she believed what? it had happened. I sort of backed away, and a vicar who didn't like me came over and carried it on. Right. Uh, <laughs> and it was quite a big sort of turning point because I actually started to lose my faith, such as it was from that point. Because right. I thought, are we allowed to swear on this? Yes, you can say whatever. I thought it was fucking crazy wow, was and I uh, yeah did, did you that yeah, was, that was good too, I wasn't expecting you to go that far <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I uh, yeah it was very very weird and I put she was sort of lurching all around and being weird and I was on the prayer team and she was in my section of a big worship meeting I was right. at uh, and uh, uh, I went over to pray for her and I put my hand on her back and she flicked her head around and went you're burning me uh, and at that point I thought I'm so out of my depth here <laughs> I haven't even seen The Exorcist <laughs> and I started backing away a bit and uh, the vicar came, who didn't like me came over and carried it on and, uh, and he dealt with it and I ran away and thought what the hell am I doing, what is this and actually I told this story recently it sounds to like you put a demon into someone <laughs> well, no, that's why, that's... funnily enough I told this story recently <laughs> to um, you know Ian Stone Yes. That, uh, I told this to him recently a comedian called Ian Stone and he said has it ever occurred to you Katie that when you went over to that woman and you put your hand on her back and it burnt her that that was the demon leaving her and <laughs> yeah. entering you yeah. <laughs> I was like thanks thanks a lot but Ian. that's bizarre so that woman I mean either that woman was possessed by a demon yeah or that woman was pretending to be possessed by a demon for attention I think there's there's a sort of kind third way is there okay yeah <laughs> where we could say she is emotionally disturbed okay. uh, to such an extent that she believes she sincerely believes herself to have a demon and that 10,000 other people in the room were willing to collude in that yes uh, and that lent it a sort of authenticity but no obviously now I think it's bullshit yeah <laughs> I had a sort of strange experience. I, I had an uh, ex-girlfriend who became very uh, cr Christian after I'd broken up with her, because oh. after me, only Jesus will do. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and uh, she joined kind of, uh, you know, one of, one of the more uh, well-known uh, but happy clappy kind of cultish <laughs> One of the more well-known ones. Yeah, well, it's the, I, I don't know if it properly is a couple. I went, I did go along, so it, mm -hmm. felt, it felt very weird. But I was walking down, I was in Balham at the time, and I was very depressed, and my life felt like it was falling apart. And I went past the house, and it said, there was a sticker in the window, and it said, Jesus loves you. And I said, all right, Jesus, if you love me, give me a sign. And like about 20 minutes later, that girlfriend rang up and said, do you want to come to a, get a carol service with me? And I went, oh, God, I better go then, because that, that might be, this might, Jesus has sort of answered, not immediately, but he's got a lot on his plate. Uh, and that's quite good. 20 minutes wait time is not bad for Jesus. And yeah, I mean, it's better than Addison Lee. Yeah. They, um... <laughs> but then I went... Yeah. And I found the whole thing incredibly creepy. And uh, <laughs> fair enough, it was you the, do it have to the... meet Jesus halfway. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but it was like loads of you know, it was men in suits. Loads of Christians. Well, there was a lot of Christians, but then there was sort of people giving testimonies as these yeah. guys in suits stood behind them, saying, "Oh, you saved my life!" And turned around. It just felt like a bit. Are you creepy. sure it was a cow concert and not a Nation of Islam? Well, meeting. I was, ex <laughs> I was actually thinking this will be quite nice. I'm a bit lonely. It'd be nice to go and sing some hymns and remember yeah. my own Christian childhood where we did that. And then there wasn't enough hymn singing, and there was a lot of talk about how brilliant the church that we were in was and not so much about Jesus just them and then do you want to come downstairs and talk about and everyone was giving 10% of their income to the yeah, church yeah. and all this. There was, there's not much talk of Jesus it's mainly about yeah it's mainly about singing and making smoothies <laughs> any good Christian evangelical Christian youth group will have a smoothie maker right uh, and that is how they lure innocent teenagers in <laughs> fat and condoms no not condoms <laughs> yeah, they don't use condoms no 
Uh, so, uh, they're just fuck you. Uh, so, um, they're back. That's my understanding of the, of the you know. It's if you have what? enough faith, those children won't get pregnant. That is that if you have enough faith in Jesus, Jesus will make sure. My that. sister knew, knew some people from the deep south of America who were kind of really full on Baptist comedians, and one of them had a phrase about like you know about going to the next level with Jesus. That he said, "I'm ready to take the condom off <laughs> with Jesus." Yeah, I know. Your appalled silence is appropriate. <laughs> Yeah, it's, uh, it's, well, I, I've, I've talked about it in a recent podcast, but yes, we were in Indiana and there's basically they had a graveyard to all the uh, on the school's playing field at, over the school holidays. They had crosses put up for all the, the abortions within the county. Oh my god! So you know, every sperm sacred. Don't waste one. <laughs> I thought, and I said they should have a cross for every sperm that wasted in masturbation as well. If they were, if they were really committed, and it was four children for every cross, which you know, if you're going to do it, do it fucking properly anyway. Yeah, yeah, yeah. One across each, and one for every sperm. Right. I would say. The people here disagree. They, 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 think, they, they, think, they think that's too far. I'm just doing that thing where I'm just, I'm just sort of jogging along, treading water, till I figure out how to re-enter the conversation. <laughs> it's fair enough. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, I was, I was, my family were quite religious, so I mean, and they're less so now. But I was, I was made to go to church when I was young, and so how that's young? why. It t- well, like all it? the time. I mean, well, not every. I didn't. I sort of did to begin with, and I, was, I remember being about eight or nine and thinking, "Oh, I should read a passage from the Bible every night to show how good I am." You know, they, they gave you that little Burgundy New Testament, the good news, and you'd and I'd try and read a bit every night. But I kind of I realised quite quickly that it was nonsense. I mean, I did a routine. I did a show about about my uh, my relationship with Jesus as well, uh, and I, I one of the routines, the big routine about the Abraham begat Isaac, Isaac begat Jacob, which you'll know if you where I memorised the first page of the New Testament, that basic premise of that routine, I realised when I was about eight years old, and I said to my mum, I said, well, there's a big list of all the people that Jesus is related to, and it goes through Joseph at the bottom. And then I said, but, you know, Joseph isn't Jesus' dad, so why, that doesn't make any sense. And my mum went, yeah, uh, and shut up. Go, go, go and, <laughs> <laughs> and you saw that it's little things like that where you just, re- that's the first page of the New Testament. That yeah. So when you realise there's things that don't make sense in this. It's and a shit first page. Yeah, it really is. I a mean, shit it's first not page. a way, if you, it's not a first sentence to pull you in, is it? But a lot of it the is. Old Testament stories are quite exciting. I mean, Sodom and Gomorrah yeah. and all of that, turning to pillars of salt and. Yeah. and bum sex and all of that sort of stuff like I think the thing is some of the Old Testament stories are genuinely quite exciting and I was always fascinated by the one about um, sacrificing the son and then God saying no I didn't mean it (laughs) and then saying here's a goat instead you know I was always really worried as a child when I was very little like what if God hadn't got there in time (laughs) with the goat what if he'd been there have been 20 minutes wait for that for (laughs) for Abraham and Isaac there were less people around then. It was easier for, yeah, for God to get him. To yeah, get less, him. <laughs> less people believed in him as well. You know, so it was just like one tribe, really, then. And then yeah, it was just one tribe. To look after. And then it just got out of control. Yeah. God has been a victim of his own success. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and some people think he's a different kind. You know, it's all the same God, isn't it, for most of these most of these yes, there's religions. a lot. All of, I, I always like to think about all the all of them have this birth story of. Um, but can I just say I do have a theology degree, but I did almost nothing towards it. <laughs> so uh, other than my own personal crazy experiences of being a teenage Christian, I'm sort of fumbling my way with the theology here. I don't know if anyone's picking up on that. It's all right, I can cover you. I know I've, I'm obsessed. Okay, great, I'm great, obsessed great. with uh, the. Like, I'm always. And that's that's why I did my show about about Jesus because I'm you know I'm an atheist, but I'm just obsessed with him to to a degree. That is worrying. <laughs> but I've, I've always thought Stuart Lee will eventually become an archbishop. <laughs> uh, yeah, eventually. Just what you've done there we're is... We're both so anti it that, you know, you can't, it's, it's sort of like, you know, people who are homophobic, you kind of go, yeah, come on. <laughs> <laughs> what's, what's the real story here? <laughs> we're both so anti-religion, it's because we both really believe Jesus is great. Because, we yeah, deep him. down, you just, you're trying to fight it, but yeah. you can't. Mm. I think it's probably both. I want to bum Jesus. <laughs> and... <laughs> That too far? Well, no, I wouldn't. Not for I, me. I really not love for it. Me. I, I, love I can't it. vouch for all of your I, listeners. Oh, my listeners are fine with this. Uh, I think anyone who's been listening to this for a while who would be worried about that has probably disappeared by now. I saw Anne Whittacombe wearing a badge. This one's not for me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I don't think Anne Whittacombe wants to listen. If she does, she's, there's worse things Anne Whittacombe has to worry about in this, in this podcast. <laughs> Anne Whittacombe's on the list above Jesus. Uh, so, um, like people you want to bum? Yeah, yeah. definitely. <laughs> She's on my list. My, I've got a celeb. Have you got a celebrity shag list of people you're allowed to have sex with that you're in your marriage? Because me and my wife have. She's just interested in Sawyer from Lost. 
which I think is a wasted vote because <laughs> it's sense she's what essentially she's getting. Yeah, sure. Um, I, I've, I've, there's a few. Mine ch- changes around a bit. I like Fenella from Furchester Hotel, a, who's a puppet. But I've got a, there's a big problem I've with puppets. <laughs> Like, uh, well, the trouble is the hole's quite big in a puppet. <laughs> yeah. You might not get a lot of traction. Mind. But I thought Anne Whittaker... <laughs> Anne Whittaker I think you'd do be all right. All You've right. got someone push... There's a person in there as well. <laughs> so there's something to push against. <laughs> Literally, they're push. I've thought it through. Um, so uh, Anne Whittaker was on there because, you know, the challenge. <laughs> Anne, no, you're going to unchurched, uncharted territory. You know, it's, literally, it's hard to find a virgin these days. I um, depends where you look. I, uh, <laughs> it's hard to find a seventy-five-year-old virgin. <laughs> we don't. We. I think my husband and I have the same person on the list, which okay. is just Beyonce. Mm. I think uh, I don't. I haven't really thought too hard about it. It's quite an ad hoc thing, isn't it? Yeah. I think. I think. I think we haven't got a formal list. No. But I feel like you know we're sort of simpatico on it. Like if he came back and he met sort of. I think Angelina Jolie should be yeah. on everyone's list. Uh, okay. Like, if you get the opportunity... So if he came back with Angelina Jolie and, and shared it with you, that would yeah. be fine. Uh, but yeah. I think even if he didn't, I'd be like, fair play. Yeah. But, <laughs> like, I'd be like, that's good, and I want to hear all about it, but, yeah. you know, try living with the woman. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Like, I, <laughs> I don't feel like I'm going to lose out in the marriage stakes to Angelina Jolie. No. I feel fairly confident that I'm lower maintenance than yeah. Angelina Jolie. <laughs> but I acknowledge that she is a kind of sexual tyrannosaur, <laughs> and therefore you'd have to let that go. Okay. That's nice of you. I don't think my wife is as... Even she, she would allow the ones on the laminated list, but no, okay. one, no one else. So I, I, I've, I think now we've got a two-and-a-half-year-old two and child and another one on the way. If my wife managed to have an affair, I would actually just... I'd be the same. I'd just be impressed. Like, yeah. how did you, we're so tired. How did you find the time? I just would go, well... I would really go, well done. Yes. <laughs> congr- I've got a two-and-a-half-year-old as well. I don't, know how, I don't know how anyone has yeah. another child. Yeah. I mean, you just sort of, you know, you become you frightened. Have to, you have to farm it out. Yeah. <laughs> you have to farm it out to get some other people to do the work. What, have the children? <laughs> wow, I'm getting a real insight into the herring household. Yeah. Uh, it's nice being a parent, though. It's very nice being yeah. a parent. Yeah, you know, that's what you're supposed to say, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> it's all worth it in the end, isn't it? For that one smile, my entire mental health that's now shot to pieces is worth it for that one smile. They'll be gone in, in 15, 20 years as well. I mean, you get rid of them then. The current climate? Yeah, maybe a bit longer, yeah. No, I'm, uh, I'm, no, I'm, I'm glad to be a parent. Yeah. Let, let me set that for the record. <laughs> okay, so because we're effectively broadcasting from the past. We are, yeah, yeah. So I wondered if you, like, would you, what as you as 49-year-old now, yeah. what would you like to say to your 50-year-old self <laughs> as this message from the past? Well, I, 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 I need it to come the other way, really. Wait. Because if I'd been... I, it's going to be harder for me to engineer. It is. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, I think like at 40, if the 50-year-old me come, what the fuck are you worried about? <laughs> You're really not old, don't worry. Yeah. You know, you've got... Have six more months of messing around, then you'll meet your wife and it'll be fine anyway. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, you know, but, you know just, it, it's, it's good to... It's, I'm, glad, I'm glad the way my life's turned out really, although I wish I'd had kids earlier in a way. I should have three families by now with three yeah. different wives. You should have a, you should have a kind of a, a large number of angry people dotted yeah. around the country yeah. and kind of make it awkward at Christmas. Yeah. So you feel that's the kind of man you really ought to be. Yeah, that's how it should be. But because I messed it all up, I've just got one, the one wife. One, one loving wife. One family. <laughs> and one family, and that's a we disappointment. Go places and there's no, there's no tension. No. Wow. <laughs> Give it time. She, she listens to this one. She doesn't listen to the backstage one. Uh, so... <laughs> It went weird backstage. That's the. That's the oh, well, I'm talking about. If you don't, you should become a monthly badger. If you're not a monthly badger, because we do backstage interviews that are really good. And the, and the one with Adam Buxton, which is as we speak, has just gone up. The backstage interview. I asked a new emergency question, which I think is a cracker of an emergency question, but it might not. I think this is as good as as have you ever flown a kite? That's how, that's how. I don't want to build it up too much. Let me just get the wording this right. I think in terms of discovering childhood memories, uh, this will this will do it. Uh, I'm good. What is the? This, oh no, that's no, that's a different. No, no, no. I, I think I can remember it anyway. What is the weirdest thing you have ever found in the empire embers of a bonfire? I'll do it again because I messed it up. What's the strangest thing you've ever found in the embers of a bonfire? <laughs> the Adam Buxton response to this was: it's the same. For a second, there'll be nothing, and then it was the. It was like I'd opened him up like a. 
you heard it, Andy McH? <laughs> the emotional resonance. Got anything? No. I just... I, I still don't understand what Adam Buxton said. It was just a sort of series of sound effects and sort of an emotional kind of... Uh... All right. Have you ever flown a kite? Yes. Yeah. How was that? Tell me about that. It's shit flying a kite. It's massively overrated. Yeah, why? Because it never goes up in the air. And when it does go up in the air, it becomes immediately terrifying. <laughs> because it always, the force of the wind is frightening. Yeah. And there's other people flying kites around. And, and it's a weirdly sort of Edwardian hobby that doesn't feel appropriate in the internet age. <laughs> and I'm constantly terrified of, um, of it being electrocuted. Uh, but mainly what I remember is kind of being made to run along very fast with my dad holding the kite a sort of 100 okay. metres away, Here just flinging it repeatedly in the air yeah. while it kind of then nosedives onto the field over and over again whilst you sort of just run around and around. like, And then everyone gets cross and you go home. That's, that's how did that kind of... affect your relationship with your parents? <laughs> Have you seen Mary Poppins? <laughs> <laughs> they did well. Uh, they were yeah. good at flying kites, though, at the end. What is the I think it's a beautiful question. What is the strangest thing? I'm going to ask it to Julian Clary, and Julian Clary, I think, has a good answer to this, because I've been reading his book. So I, you'll see. You'll see I, what it was. I have found, like... Let's, here we go, here we go! <laughs> well, no, I, but I know where they came from. They're sort of melted, sort yeah. of weird remains of a, at the inside of a clock. Well, how did you not think that was a brilliant answer? <laughs> what was know. a clock doing on the bonfire? What bonfire was it? It just didn't feel very funny. I it don't, was. It was. We were burning some stuff from a house that we bought that was had an odd previous owner who had a. <laughs> but a yeah, had I done it? How could you not say this was a brilliant question? <laughs> yeah. That had a secret shed behind. <laughs> <laughs> secret shed behind where they kept some chickens um, and this man wouldn't let me in the house once we'd you know there's a period after you put in the offer and, yeah. and before you buy it but you exchange contracts usually people let you go in and measure up or they'll just allow you and we were not allowed to go there ever again because he was too busy him. burning all his clocks yeah, I think so yeah, yeah but he made a kind of big pile of stuff and he was a very he was a slightly frightening man yeah uh, and uh, yeah so a big kind of melted kind of warped grandfather clock inside just the metal pendulums and <laughs> like the melted hands of it it was kind of it's quite creepy actually yeah oh so you didn't have an answer to that question <laughs> well, tell my brilliant question I told you it was a brilliant question do you think he was a time traveller and he was burning his he was just be, and he was going on his final journey and he thought I'll burn all the clocks that I keep because a time traveller you've got to have loads of clocks in your house but when you come back and go yep yeah. It's the time. It is the I, time I thought he, it was. Maybe he brings a clock yeah. back from the past every do. time he travels, and that was a genuine Victorian grandfather clock yeah. that he then had to get rid of the evidence yeah. fast. Yeah. You could just get clocks in the past by <laughs> going to shop and buying them. By buying You don't have to go, it was a clock from the future, that would be it. <laughs> but like a clock from the past, just wait for the time to pass until the clock is old enough for you to be satisfied. There's loads of grandfather enough. clocks. I guess you could just go. And then why set it on shop. fire at the end? Yeah. No, I'm not saying I understand the man. <laughs> <laughs> just saying I moved into his house. That's all. Well, no, I bought his house. Yeah. It's now my. I didn't move into his house. Sure. That, sure. Suddenly, I seem sure like the weirdo. <laughs> what did you do with the melted bit of the the pendulum of the clock? I just poked it a bit and left it there. <laughs> and, the and we burnt other stuff on top, on top of, it. of it. Yeah. So it's still there. It might be yeah. growing. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe it's, you know, once the... Uh, was that a verse of the grandfather's clock? My grandfather's clock was too tall for his shelf. Yep. So we burnt it in a fire. <laughs> <laughs> and then, and then he, that's when he came back to life like a phoenix. I don't know. <laughs> so, yeah. A tiny tree will come out and, like, little grandfather clocks will grow on it like pears. <laughs> it could be. It's a bit like the clangers. Um, yeah, remember them? They're still on. They're still on with Michael yeah, Palin. They are. Who was one of my big crushes? Yeah, I'm mine. Yeah, yeah. He's on my laminate. Is he? Yeah. <laughs> I think he might. Be, I think he might be on mine. I might add him on. He's certainly on my laminate of guests I would like to have on this show. Yes. Uh, but uh, <laughs> he's not coming on. How of your laminate? Mm -hmm. How likely are you to actually meet any of them? Well, many of them are puppets or fictional characters. <laughs> But I like to, I know, I like to set myself a challenge. I, um, there were, I once overheard boys in my school talking about which Disney uh, characters they'd most like to have sex with. Yeah. And I heard one of them going, but I wouldn't do Pocahontas because she's rough. <laughs> I thought that's, they were quite, having quite a forensic conversation yeah. about... 
are the nice. I think Poc- I think if I was going, Pocahontas would be near, near the top of would my. Would she be in your yeah. top three? <laughs> She'd be in the top. I think so. I don't. My daughter's mainly into Monsters Inc. I would probably do Scully from that. <laughs> Is he the little bowling ball one? Yeah, I do him. I mean, that's sort of like doing Zippy. It's a similar sort of thing. And uh, she likes Finding Nemo. Tell what would happen to Nemo when I found him. <laughs> I've never watched Finding Nemo and I've only seen little bits of it. It's but very it's, sad. Well, it's, I mean, I'm it's just, I kind of want to sit down and watch the whole thing because it's quite a complicated, because a fish gets taken out of the ocean into a dentist. Yeah. And another fish has to find that fish yeah. in a tank in a dentist. His dad has to find yeah. him. That's quite a challenge. I'm, I'm interested to see how they overcome the, you know, to be the honest, problem. From a, from a plot point of view, it's unconvincing. <laughs> it is. But from yeah. an animation point of view, it's beautiful. They luckily find a fish that can read, I think, because that's part of the, the way they get there. Yeah, the, well, the fish are very well trained. But, you know, fish can only uh, breathe underwater. Yes, they did know that, yeah. which so I think that's it's quite... Uh, <laughs> so it's quite a challenge. I think, it's relative. I think most fish in that situation would go... Oh, well, I'll just have some more kids. <laughs> no, no, you, the, the, the rest of the little Nemos yeah. and the wife, it's quite, a, it's quite a harrowing beginning, okay. get eaten by a barracuda, and so only Nemo is left, which makes his father very over-anxious. It's a film I'd about... I'd find another fish, and this, no, there well, are plenty more fish I'd, in the sea. I'd, <laughs> I'd urge you to watch it, because it's actually, it's a very emotionally, it's a very emotionally literate and complex yeah. film about the nature of fatherhood. Yeah. And I think you'd rather enjoy it. Well, they're all, though, aren't they? They're all, like, like The Lion King, I've never seen. That's very yeah. disturbing. I, I, ch- the, I tell you who I fancied. Yeah. The fox, I was going to say the fox that plays Robin Hood. In, uh, <laughs> <laughs> it does it, but obviously... <laughs> it's good you like the actor, not the character, because I'm the opposite. I, I like the characters, not the actors. I don't like him when he is Robin Hood. I like him in his real life backstage. They do some interviews with him behind the scenes. He's quite unlike Robin Hood. Well, he's all the best bits of Robin Hood, yeah. but then, you know, he's got a sort of... He's, he's quite down to earth. Yeah. <laughs> what a shame we can't have sex with cartoons. What a shame, what a shame with children's cartoons. <laughs> what a shame it is. Um, I was going to ask, we talk, talk, I was talking about a guest that I want to get on the show. And, uh, oh, a guest I want to get on the show. <laughs> can you well, help, let me can know you if help? I can help. Yeah. <laughs> well, because I, I, I asked Brian Blessed, I've, did, I've asked a lot of guests about stories about Brian Blessed, and I'm going to ask you. Oh, yeah. And I asked Brian Blessed to be on this series of, of the podcast, and it's through his agent. His agent went back to me and then he said, oh, no, he's not interested in being on the podcast. And then I was in. Did the agent literally say, no, he's not Yeah, he said he, does, he doesn't think it's for him. Yeah. And then. Um, uh, then I was in uh, Wales with Miles Jupp. Miles Jupp came to, just to, he didn't come to see my show. Oh, he, maybe he did, but he, we met, he met up before the show just to say hello because he lives in uh, Monmouth where I was, I was gigging. And uh, I was in the book. I met him in a bookshop, and the bloke behind the bookshop, the book, uh, bloke behind the bookshop, said, "Oh, Miles, um, would you like to interview Brian Blessed? He's coming to do book talks all around the country." So Brian Blessed was prepared to be interviewed by anyone who the book, bookshop owner happened to meet in a bookshop in Monmouth. <laughs> But he didn't think this was a big enough deal for him to put on his book tour. Uh, and then, but I know uh, Brian Blessed's daughter, my brother-in-law does lots of plays with her, and I'd sort of said, oh, well, I know his daughter maybe, you know, and, and then Brian Blessed said to his daughter, oh, I, I, I was a friend of yours who was trying to get me on one of his shows, Mr. Tuna? I think it's Mr. Tuna. <laughs> and it took about 10 minutes to work out what, you know, but... He's, he would quite like to come on, I think. So it's, it's, we, we might get him on, is what I'm saying. Uh, but we'll see I if we am... get him on. But, I w- but in the meantime, because you're not Brian Blessed, who I would really Sorry. want to be on. Yeah, no, fair have enough. You ever, have you ever met Brian Blessed? Do you have a story about Brian Blessed? I have stories. I've never met him. Oh, I mean, what? I've got ones that I've heard and that we all know, Like, but my favourite of which is this claim that he has that he delivered a baby yeah. from a woman underneath a tree in Richmond Park and yeah. then and bit through the umbilical cord. Yes, well, I mean, I will be asking him about that. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I had a more personal, that not many people know, from someone who was in a, re- uh, a read-through with him for a show uh, and um, he was very late. <laughs> so they started the read-through. One of the parts uh, was written for and played by uh, an actor of um, small stature. I, okay. I'm not sure. I, I genuinely, I'm not being snide or snitty here. I genuinely don't know what the term that they are they prefer to use is. It's hobgoblin. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, there was an actor there all that time, yeah. and uh, and the uh, 
And my friend said, who was one of the writers, that Brian Blessed was 20 minutes late and crashed through, they started without him, crashed through the door like mid sentence, talking to no one except himself, just going, and then the junction on the M25! As if, as if like he had been in the middle of telling someone about his journey and why he was late. And as he walked in, he stopped when he saw this guy, and oh, there was a junction on the M25 and there was a lorry overturn. And he saw this small actor and he went, I don't like those! <laughs> And then when he took his seat, and inevitably by the end, Brian Blessed and this actor were best friends. Uh, now, I don't know if any of that is true, uh, so I wouldn't want to besmirch the name okay. of Brian Blessed any more than he has already. Uh, but it is one of my favourite. I, st I still sometimes, when I'm driving along, out of nowhere, if I'm just bored on a train, I'll just get, I don't like those! Uh, I think given, given that most of the stories Brian Blessed tells about himself can't possibly be true, <laughs> I don't think it's possible to libel him, is it? I don't think, I don't it's, I don't, I don't think it's possible. I don't, I don't think it's possible. I saw him interviewed with Did his he? daughter once. Yes. And uh, who I presume is your Rosalind, friend. Rosalind, yeah. Uh, and I felt for her, actually, because although she clearly loves and respects her father, they were sat at the kitchen table, and the interviewer was trying to ask her questions. I think it was meant to be a touching kind of parent and child in showbiz <laughs> sort of interview. And he, he would ask her a question, like, what's it like to be the daughter of someone like Brian Blessed? And he would go, well, I think what she <laughs> made me build! And, and it was like, over and over again, this interviewer just going, that's great, Brian, thanks so much, Brian, but if I could just ask... Uh, and she just sort of sat there so politely and nicely, and I just thought, that was, that's your whole life, yeah. isn't it? <laughs> But imagine your dad being Brian Blessed. How cool that would be. <laughs> that would be awesome. Uh, <laughs> um, so you started your career by impersonating Margaret Thatcher. Yes, I did. Yeah. For a woman who worked at my dad's <laughs> right. work. I mean, what happens is, you know, when you do interviews and things and like press for shows and like people always want to know when did you first think you were funny? Who Do you remember the first time you made someone laugh? And um, this sounds like something I've made up, but it's something I remembered during one of those interviews. And I was really pleased with it because then I had something to say that was true <laughs> for all the other times someone would ask me that in an interview. And it, it is true that I, there was a woman called Camilla at my dad's work and I was there for, uh, when I was about six and it must have been half term or something. So I was at his work just sort of, um, you know, being looked after. Uh, and, uh, and I started saying, my name is Margaret Thatcher <laughs> as a six year old. And she laughed. I didn't know who Margaret Thatcher was. I just knew she was this woman who was on the telly that made everyone angry. And, uh, and so I just said it over and over again. Hello, I'm Margaret Thatcher. <laughs> and she thought this was the most amazing thing coming out of this six year old. Uh, and she gave me 50p. So I like to think that's my first <laughs> yeah. paid gig. <laughs> I turned pro that very day. <laughs> it was a good satire of her. Yeah. I think that's <laughs> But you, you, well, you were doing lots of... You, 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 it's interesting, because you, you did some comedy at university, but then I did. you, then you be, went, did stuff in production. You did all the challenge TV. I and, did, and, yeah. And, run, and ran. I worked uh, for a show called Dream Road. Makers, yeah. uh, where we made people's dreams come true. That's nice. Yeah, well, I mean, only if their dream was within budget. <laughs> 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 if you were a child, you know, and, and you needed your dream to come true because something had happened, but your dream was to sit in a wheelbarrow in a bow tie, then you were very likely to get on the show. <laughs> anything more complicated than that. We had a website where um, people could write on it, like people they knew or friends or family that they felt deserved a nice thing to happen. And we would have to verify, uh, as a member of the production team, we would have to verify that the person they were talking about, A, that it was true that this thing had happened to them that made them deserve a treat. Right. And two, that this was their dream. So my job was to go to these places incognito, try and work my way into these strangers' houses and establish as fast as I could whether something tragic had happened to them, what it was and what their dream was. <laughs> <coughs> and I won the worst one was I uh, a woman uh, who had had some awful stuff happen to her with people, you know, husbands dying, three husbands dying, I mean, awful stuff. A lovely woman who lived in Wales, her daughter said she, her dream was to um, fly in a hot air balloon. So I said to her daughter, how can I get to see her and get her to say all this to me to verify it without her knowing who I am or spelling a rap? So she said, oh, she really loves antiques. So if you phone her up and say you're from BBC Homes and Antiques, magazine uh, and that she's won a visit that she'll let you in basically and she'll talk to you so I did that uh, and I did get in there and we started to strike up a conversation but what she made me do was value everything she had in the house. <laughs> Whilst I was trying to get her to tell me about all the husbands she's had that had died. 
and that her dream was to go up in a hot air balloon. And in the end, she brought me down this rocking horse and asked my advice about whether it would affect the value if she had it repaired. <laughs> I said, I have to get the fuck out of here before I destroy all these women's antiques. <laughs> so it was quite a stressful job. So I thought going back into comedy would be easier. Yeah. Well, that's quite a good way of just conning old ladies out of money and yes. stuff. <laughs> Pretend you work for Homes and Antiques. Yeah. I hope I haven't... I mean, that is, this isn't a kind of manual. <laughs> <laughs> Ask them about the stuff. Yeah. And they'd say, what is your dream? And well, they're in the hot air balloon. Nick all Nick all the stuff. <laughs> <laughs> so you came, but you, you were very quickly successful, really. You kind of had one of those things that doesn't happen at Edinburgh. Yeah. Where it, you went and did an Edinburgh show and then someone said, come and do a TV show. Yeah, I did. It was, it was one of those weird, fast things. I, I did, when I was 25, so 13 years ago now, I... Um, I'd spent four years doing TV production, doing stuff like question checking uh, for Challenge TV and stuff like that. Uh, and then I thought, I really do regret not going uh, into comedy out of university. I saw friends of mine who had friends I'd done comedy with at university. Uh, and I thought, I'll regret it if I don't give it a go. So, and now seems like a good time, 25, you know, I haven't really got anything to lose. So I wrote some monologues and I did them in pubs and some guys saw me and they got me into a group called Ealing Live, which was a big sketch show, which was every Thursday at the Ealing Studios. And it was a kind of really brilliant team of 15 or so sketch comedians, most of whom are the best sort of, you know, they're all the great people on TV doing sketches. And uh, yeah, so I got into that. And then I did that for a year and then I thought, I'll just do an Edinburgh show because, again, I haven't got anything to lose. No, there's no expectation. Uh, and I was starting to do celebrity spoofs. And it was around the time Heat magazine was at its peak. So it kind of all just kind of weirdly came together. I think there were a couple of TV channels looking for a kind of version of Heat magazine yeah. on the telly. And it just so happened that that's what I was doing. So even though every night I was playing in a room <coughs> of 50 seats in a cave <laughs> in the Pleasance, and I was on at 11.30 at night, and... Uh, it's the cellar, I don't know if any of you have ever been in there, but what would happen, it would be so hot and the sweat of other people's audiences throughout the day <laughs> would sort of evaporate off them. And then by the time it got to my show, it would have condensed on the ceiling and it would rain down on my audience <laughs> as a kind of fine mist. And I would normally have about four or five people in, but like they say, like the kind of apocryphal Edinburgh, if you just have one or two people in who make decisions about yes. telly, then it can all happen weirdly quickly. Yeah. So that is what happened. I gigged a lot before that, but yeah, nothing like the kind of period of time other people have put in yeah it's, it's and it, do you feel that that was a, an advantage or a disadvantage because you, you did the three series did you of uh, yeah, the three, big yeah. ass show mm -hmm. which is very good and there's lots of clips of it on uh, youtube i didn't see yeah. it at the time but there's lots of uh, there are yeah there lots, are lots i did lots of song spoofs yeah. pop spoofs and stuff that people have put on there and yeah. things yeah at some point i probably ought to monetize it <laughs> is that what you're supposed to do now uh, um yeah don't bother don't worry yeah, just bother. do a book do a book of emergency questions oh okay so is that your book of emergency you, questions that's my book of emergency questions oh, that's, that's how good. you do it uh but then you use all that money to make more podcasts then you go oh shit <laughs> <laughs> got at some point it's got to stop and what you want is a giant hairy piggy bank called the brian blessed fund <laughs> yeah. and you can put a pound in yeah every, and then eventually you'll have enough money that to lure him on yeah i don't think it would take that much money <laughs> <laughs> I, don't, I don't think it would 50 uh, pounds and some new crampons because when you when you <laughs> when you when i met him he said he was going to mars like, not, as, not for a TV show, literally. So I'm training to go to Mars. Just for so the I said, weekend. I said, what, for a TV show? He said, no, I'm going to, I'm going to Mars. <laughs> and, like, literally, he had told a big story about going to Mars. Okay. And then he didn't go to Mars. No. I think he did a TV show about going to Mars. <laughs> but I think he thought he was going to Mars. I think they, they'd select out of everyone. They thought, who can we get to go with the first mission to Mars? <laughs> Shall we get, like, a 65-year-old, quite unfit man? Actually, that's not fair. He's, he has he climbs Everest, Everest, Everest all the time. He climbs Everest like he's not the fittest Easter. bloke in the world, though, is he? Brian Breston. Well, not. if you've got to climb Everest twice a year, you must be quite fit. I mean, what's your benchmark, Richard? Fucking hell! I would be sending him to Mars because it's a long journey to it Mars. Is a long journey. Think of the other astronaut. If he's on his own, it's fine. He can't take. <laughs> I'm pretty sure you have to have some quite serious, like, biometric personality <laughs> yeah, testing. Uh, and things. Maybe, maybe. Yeah. But wait, you, so you did three series of. I mean, it seemed that you did the big ass show and then it stopped, and then you sort of thought, I'm giving up comedy almost. Is that fair or not? I wouldn't say quite or, giving up comedy, but I, um, I did three series. I was really. It, I'm, I'm really proud of them. I'm glad I did them, and they were definitely, like, representing what I was doing, what I wanted to do comedy wise at the time, more or less. Um, although there's always a bit of bartering about with, when it comes to TV, you know, I'll have a bit of that and then, you, you know, but you have to do a bit of that. It was always like I could have one Jesus' girlfriend sketch as long as I did two Lily Allen sketches. <laughs> it was a kind of trade-off with the channel quite a lot. 
Uh, but I was really p- pleased with it. But then I just knew by the end of the third series that I didn't want to do that anymore. I didn't want to do those sorts of sketches, those sort of big noisy sketches and pop spoofs and all that sort yeah. of stuff. And I'd really enjoyed it, but I didn't want to do that anymore. And so it just can be quite hard when you want to do something different in a different style or whatever, uh, but people know you for one thing. It just takes a really long time to sort of turn a ship sure, around yeah, like sure. that. So, and also I wasn't quite sure what I wanted to do and I wasn't, like I'm doing live comedy again now but more like stand up and I didn't know if I could do that then and it wasn't, didn't really occur to me. So I had a kind of three years of sort of slightly drifting around, knowing I didn't want to do that but not quite knowing what to point myself at and yeah. just sort of wondering, sort of slightly pathetically wondering, sort of sitting on it. If it was a black and white beach, you know, in a black and white film staring out on the horizon, that's sort of what I did for three <laughs> years, which yeah. isn't very funny, no. essentially. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. No, but I think, you know, I think, um, I think that's a part of forging a career, and most people will go through something like that at some, at some point. I think especially, I mean, you know, I, 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 similarly, I mean, I, I was, yeah, we, were quite, we were sort of successful quickly, and then you suddenly go, oh, and then it stops, and then you suddenly go, oh, what am I going to do? Mm. And you have this kind of wilderness period where you're trying to work out what to do next. Yeah. And it's and it's an odd thing I think when you've been project you know, I think if it's quick, what I regret is slightly is that we were it, it was even though we worked hard and there was five years or so before we got a TV show, five years to get a TV show is still incredibly fast. Yeah. And you're projecting that position and and then it's taken away from you, but also you don't really appreciate because you just thought, oh, this has happened. You don't really appreciate it unless it's a long, a long form thing that you're building up to something. So I think it can sort of be a bit weird when suddenly you're sort of plucked and then fated, and then suddenly it's like, oh, you know, maybe not now. Yeah, I so think. So was it a little bit getting out? Was there a little bit of that, or was it no, really, really I your wasn't, decision? This really sounds like I'm an asshole, but it was actually my decision <laughs> yeah. not to do a fourth series. Mm. I was offered it, and I didn't want to do it. I was so definite. Whether or not that was the right thing to do, I'm not sure. But I, I think I was so clear that I didn't want to do sketches, and I felt like I had to make a really clean break. Like People would be like, oh, can you come and ride a chopper bike down a red carpet dressed as Lily Allen uh, just for a kind of PR stunt? Or can you come and open this shop pretending <coughs> to be the queen? And I had to be like, yeah, uh, there's a, I can see the fun in that, but if I keep doing little things like that, I'll never get away from this yeah so it was I just couldn't I just wasn't sure how to be creatively I know that sounds a bit pompous but I didn't know what I I was I want to write a book I want to write long form things uh, I want to have a slightly different sort of uh, I don't know like a different I just I just wanted to be a different sort of performer and writer to what I'd been and that sounds a bit spoiled but I didn't I didn't quite know how to make that happen and I needed a bit of time I think just to grow up and get used to it all and i a lot of my show had been promoted in um, like lots of pictures. I was always in the Sun. We always gave the Sun a picture exclusive, and every single week, without fail, they'd put a picture of me dressed as a celebrity and the picture of the celebrity next to me, and point out that I was not as thin as the celebrity. <laughs> like that. It was like, but we would continue to give them the picture exclusive because the producer and the channel were like, "Let's give it to the Sun because at least there's a picture of you in the Sun that will tell people it was on." So you just sort of look at that and go. I don't know if I want to do that for the rest of my life. <laughs> uh, so it was just sort of trying to move myself into a slightly different bracket, I think. Yeah. yeah. And that's that that doesn't you know that's that's quite a hard thing to do, and I think I'm still I'm still on that journey, mm. I suppose. Yeah. But you you did you did write a book. I did you, write a book. Yeah. You crowdfunded it. A bit sad. Uh, <laughs> and. Um, <laughs> Uh, so <laughs> that's that's a book that's oh bloody hell that's another level. Uh, so uh, but so, which is Brenda Monk is funny. Yes, that's my book. Yes, well, tell uh, us about your book. It, it was a book uh, about a woman who becomes a stand-up comedian, and I think it was definitely a good. I really loved writing it. It was my favourite thing I've done so far. I think in some respects. Uh, and it was the, the story of a woman who uh, decides to become a stand-up comedian uh, and it's the first year of her career uh, and it begins in Edinburgh and ends in Edinburgh uh, and it's, so it's her first year as a stand-up uh, and I just really loved writing it. Uh, it was really great. I'd, loved, I'd like to write her whole life. I'd like to write Brenda Monk is funny, Brenda Monk is famous, Brenda Monk is forgotten, Brenda Monk is fucked <laughs> uh, and then a word beginning with F that means having a massive triumphant comeback which I haven't managed to find yet. Yeah. Uh, anyone who can think of one please let me know. Uh, so that was that's what I'd like to do, but uh, all of that seems like a bit of a lofty ambition, a bit out of my reach at the moment, given that I haven't written any of it. <laughs> 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 Just five hundred thousand words to go. <laughs> well, that's good. It's good to have. A, have a, that, you know. But I think that um, I did a little book tour after that, uh, which got me into the idea of being myself on stage, which I think then led directly to what I'm doing more of now, which is doing stand-up. Yeah. 
And you want to, like Brian Blessed, you want to do, uh, you want to be an astronaut. Is that what your yes. show's about? Yes. So I don't know why we were laughing at Brian Blessed earlier. No. <laughs> no, I'm with, I'm with Brian Blessed. Can you imagine the show of me and Brian Blessed going to Mars <laughs> together? So is that your new show for Edinburgh? Yeah, I'm doing a show called I Could Have Been an Astronaut. Uh, last year it was I Was a Teenage Christian. Uh, next year I think I'll do I Am a Something, but I haven't figured out what that is yet. Uh, <laughs> but this year, yeah, it's about, I, about my hobby, which is space and astronomy. I love, I love space and astronomy. It's my hobby. and A hobby is anything that you like but you're shit at. Uh, otherwise, obviously, it would be your job. Uh, so I, <laughs> I, love, I love space and astronomy, but I'm terrible at maths, and I've always been terrible at maths. I was taught maths very badly. As I said, our convent school didn't do maths. Uh, so I didn't really start maths properly till I was about nine uh, and I sort of start, so I started to think what if I'd been better at maths what if I'd been taught better at maths maybe I could have been an astronaut like I could be an astronomer <laughs> yes. you know like people yeah, it's happened there's precedent Brian May yes became an astrophysicist uh, Brian Cox was a keyboard player. Brian became, Blessed's yep. gone to Mars. It's exactly. got to be called Brian, though. That's so my that's worry. The... Is that is that a, is that a kind of is that <laughs> is that a prerequisite, a hard prerequisite, of being called Brian? Because that's think it is. where I'm going to fall down on it. But it's like it's it's about like what you, what would you have become if if things had been slightly different, and what makes you what you are now, and all that sort of stuff. Yeah. Oh, good. Where are you on? In, in a, uh, the Pleasants. Pleasants, what time? The Pleasants above at, at 6.20 p.m. Oh, when, when you could, you could realistically, you could see your show. Yes. And then you could have like a, a very, very quick drunk drink and come and see my show. Oh, really? Where I'm are on you seven, on? I'm on at 7.30 at Pleasants 1, so we're... we're oh, yeah, we're yes. all right. That's we all right. can do it. Right. I'll, I'll, well, I'll I don't think night. I'm going to come and see your show, and I doubt you'll come and see mine. I might come and see yours. You've thrown can the you, gauntlet down. Can you do that? Thanks a lot, Richard. Can you do that? <laughs> like, I find it very difficult to go and see anything just before or just after. You've, yeah, you've yeah, done yeah. Your just show. after, particularly. Just oh, before. so you'll be tidying up your stuff. Yeah, I'll be tidying up all my space <laughs> stuff and having a beer. Do you not want me to come and see your I show? You seem to be to basically come, saying, don't, please you. don't fucking come and see my I show. Think, I think there'll be some room in the back. You can yeah. sneak in the back, is my, is my guess. <laughs> oh, no, I've just heard from the box office. It's, yeah, it's, it's very nearly. Tonight is very nearly sold out. I'm so amazed you wouldn't to... be sold out after those yeah. five stars from the Times. Yeah, you? amazed. That was an amazing review. I don't read my reviews, but I, you know, yeah, yeah, it's no, good because no, people no. tell you when you get good ones. Uh, that's how it works. Uh, so yeah, basically, you... if you've gone two weeks into the festival and no one's mentioned any reviews, it means they're all shit. <laughs> <laughs> um, you're from High Wycombe? Kind of. I was what? born in High Wycombe. Okay. When did you leave High Wycombe? But, um, about six weeks after I was born. Oh, okay, you might not be able to answer this question. I don't even know. What is the tallest building in High Wycombe? <laughs> is it the Wickham Swan? I don't know. Oh. I couldn't find out. I think it might be the Eden. Every, every time I did it, the Eden Shopping Centre came up, but I think that's just a big building. I don't think it's tall. But the High Wycombe's in a very deep valley. Yeah. Well, that doesn't mean buildings can't be tall. No, I it's think... Not, you don't measure buildings from the top of a hill. <laughs> you measure them from the bottom of the building. No, can, fair enough. You can put enough. it in the bottom of a valley. It's still as tall as it would be if it was on the top of a There's a difference between the, the, the highest mountain. and the tallest, isn't there? <laughs> yeah. Or something. I think so. I'm uh, not, I'm not I'm saying it's the highest say above sea level. I can say, I'm getting flashbacks to my time on stakeout. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I bet. What is your favourite High Wycombe celebrity? James Corden. Oh, yeah, he's from Isn't Highwickham. he everybody's... Uh, so I was born in High Wycombe Hospital. Yeah. Uh, and years later, because I did, to be fair, I did live near High Wycombe in Amersham. Yeah. Uh, I worked for six weeks in the holidays, summer holidays, in High Wycombe in the, in the washing up all the operating equipment. Okay. Next to the morgue. Yeah. Uh, in the basement of the hospital. Wow. And you have to wear kind of scrubs, and then, but, and you're below the operating theatres, and they send down all the equipment in dumb waiters. Wow. <laughs> like you get in a restaurant, and you have to open it up, and you get this kind of tray of blood and cartilage and uh, and bone clogged metal stuff, and then you have to wash it all up in industrial washing up stuff. Yeah. Uh, but I got that job because I'd registered with the local temp agency and um, technically it came under catering. <laughs> <laughs> because it was washing up. Yeah. Uh, but it was quite well paid. I went completely mad, but it was quite well paid. Catering for the dead. Yes. <laughs> that's going to be the name of this episode. <laughs> I'm, tell you, I'm writing it down. Because I often have trouble remembering anything that's happened in the episodes after they've happened. Because, you know, it's... You know, it's just rubbish, isn't it, this? <laughs> I mean, you yeah, know, the whole p- podcast. Uh, and uh, so it's nice, and to get, it's nice to get tired. I am, you know, my, I'm surprisingly, I'm, I'm getting through. I'm, my stomach's not rumbling yet. No. Might do by next week with Julian Clary. I'll ask you some emergency <laughs> questions. I asked you some rude ones backstage. I want to ask you a rude one, but the problem with this book is there's so many, it's hard to find specific ones. Uh, I'll try and remember what it is. If you had to insert a popular chocolate bar into your <laughs> anus, <laughs> if you had to... 
we had to do it. Which which one would you choose? I had to do it. I'm going to ask you because if I ask Julian Clary these questions, he'll think I'm being. I think it's. But I ask everyone. That's the thing. Uh, um, a twirl. Is it twirl? Yeah. Yeah, I'd say twirl um, because they come in packs of two, uh, and uh, they're quite soft, but they kind of have a nice rippled, sort of smooth out <laughs> coating. That would help it. Get I'm basically it. trying to picture a chocolate tampon. Yeah. A chocolate bumhole tampon. You could screw it. It, it would look. You have could a screw slight, it. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> slight screw. Which, especially if you Don't have a pull slight, it out quickly. If your anus is slightly d- dimpled or threaded <laughs> up, that would help. You might have to go can, go to a cosmetic surgeon and say, What's "Can I have an anus that is the reverse of a twirl?" <laughs> I'm not going to tell you why. <laughs> I reckon they'd work out why. Uh, also, if you run out of twirl, there's, yeah. there's another one in the pack. <laughs> there is. Well, you would run out because they melt very easily even if you're just holding them in your hands. That's true. Yeah. <laughs> That's the problem with the twirl, I think. From you have to eat them fast. You do. Yeah. yeah. You could keep it in the fridge. If you were going to insert it into your anus, I would recommend keeping it in the fridge for an yeah. hour or so. <laughs> That's good. <laughs> if you had to put it <laughs> If you had to, then say, but can, I, can I put it in the fridge can first? Can I just the pers- at least... And the person with a gun to your head say, well, I don't know if I've got time. <laughs> I need to know. I need to know which one it is. And to watch it happening, and then you 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 may be free to go. <laughs> not saying whether you are or not. Good, good answer. Wow, um, quite a capricious kidnapper. <laughs> this is this one. Oh, that that I found it. And the question is anally violated as well, not just put anally up. violated. Oh, yes, you have to be anally violated. Wow, I don't. No, but that's a whole different thing so now. If tw- it's if it's like non-consensual. <laughs> I think it's consensual, but just you say, "Can I be violated with it?" I don't want it to be screwed in easily, oh, okay, so it see. can't be a twirl because right, okay. I'm prepared for the, with my anus anus transplant. This is, is this this is the new Fifty Shades of Grey, isn't it? it? Is. All right, I'll ask. I'm oh, sorry, that was a that was a, a rude question. If you had to do a human centipede with two other people, <laughs> if you had to. You had to. I'm not saying you want to, but if you had to. No, no, okay. Well, let's clarify. Which, it's not that I want and to. And you were in the middle. If I had to. You're in the middle of the, the centipede. Which two people would you like to be in front of you and behind you? Well, I think you and Stu. <laughs> <laughs> who's who? Who's, 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 shit, who's 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 shit am I eating and who's yeah. eating my shit? Yeah, I think I know. <laughs> <laughs> I had to ask. I, you know, I was a big fan of Fist of you were, well, I, You've tapped into one of my fantasies. I, <laughs> I, um, I did say last time, well, I think we talked to uh, Dan Skinner about it, but we were, when we were doing the commentaries for Fist of Fun Series 1, I think, we were just, and I hadn't, you know, I hadn't watched them for 20 years and I wouldn't have known you at the time, but there's a shot that basically starts on you in the audience and then pulls <laughs> out from the audience and as they're applauding, it's Katie Brand. And I go, fucking hell, it's Katie Brand. Even our audience is more famous and successful than I am. <laughs> so it's quite a shock to I see I hate you. to break it to you, but I'm sitting next to a guy called Daniel Clarkson who originated the Potted Potter, which has become an international oh success. We were at school together. Bloody hell. And we were both obsessed with Fist of Fun. Wow. Yeah, and we so got tickets. Way, we were very excited. In a way, you both owe me a percentage. <laughs> in a way, I created Potted Potter. Is that right? In a way. In a way. And then in a way, that means I created Harry Potter. <laughs> which means in a way no. <laughs> I created Alan Partridge that's what I did <laughs> didn't get any money for that have you seen have you seen Lego Batman no because I watched it the other day and I'm everyone have, everyone, have, everyone <laughs> have been uh, did you enjoy it every story yeah I'm not going to tell you about it you need to watch it okay. um, there's two things that annoy me and they also annoyed someone else called uh, Nathaniel Tapley on uh, uh, on Facebook um, and I uh, that they refer. They don't call Daleks Daleks. They call them British robots, which makes you think that they didn't get the rights to the Daleks. What? They call them some like British scary robots or something. And then the nerds will understand what you mean. It's very insulting to us British people because we know what the Daleks are, yeah. and we don't have to. You don't have to be a nerd. To, a lot of people are nerds who like them, but people don't know they are. But also, they've got um, Ray Fiennes plays um, the butler in it, and there's Voldemort in it. But Ray Fiennes doesn't play Voldemort. I'm ge- sorry. This is Leg- Lego Batman. But why are they Daleks? They've got it? all the franchise. They don't know how they've done it. It must be very complicated. But they've got basically all they've the other. They've got Daleks. They've in got Lego, this Lego. Lego. People think, oh, Lego. We'll get some Lego figures out. Is this a dream you had after no, a lot it's of true. cheese? No, it's true. Then you see Lego Batman. It's not that good. I don't. Do you like it? He didn't like it, did you? 
you, she liked it, didn't she? And you, had to, you had to pretend you liked it, didn't you? At the time. And then she didn't like it, and now you've now I've just, I've broken up that relationship. <laughs> she was going, yeah, I like. He was going. It's ch- it was childish, wasn't it, mate? It was unexpectedly childish, wasn't it? When you went to Lego Batman, you thought this is going to be a gripping hour and a half of, the... and then suddenly it's all oh, it's way all made out of Lego. They're not even made out of Lego. It's just pretend. They've just been made to look like they're made out of Lego and they're not made out of Lego. That's what you're thinking, wasn't it? Yeah. It's not, it's not, it's not very good. I am, yeah, okay. Well, I'm glad I haven't seen it. And I'm it. annoyed because loads of people said it was good at the time. Yeah. So then I paid £5.50 to watch it on Sky because mm. I don't go out now. I think this is what's known as a conversational cul-de-sac. <laughs> <laughs> that is not for you to say. <laughs> All right, you get... For that, you get an emergency question. <laughs> What swear word would you like repeatedly shouted by a drunk man at your funeral? <laughs> the drunk man is turning up regardless and is going to shout something. So you may as well choose. I think my favourite swear word, I'd, uh, which I think should always be shouted, which is cunt. I would love someone to shout, a drunk man to shout cunt repeatedly at my funeral. I think, I think it would shake things up a bit. You know, just get everyone out of their complacent comfort zone at my funeral. Just, you know... I think it's a... Did you just whisper sad? It would be sad. It would be sad for the people mourning you. What? Not if they, they knew it was what I wanted. <laughs> Take this. She did Friends say. and family. It's my last say. request at my funeral. Please arrange for a drunk man, preferably Richard, to come and shout cunt repeatedly over my coffee. And then if anyone complains, I'll just click. I'll have this bit of the podcast ready to go. She is... She, that's what it is, what she wants. It's literally it's what, she what she wanted. wanted. This is the evidence. This is the evidence. All right, well, I'll do one that I haven't... Uh, let's find a new one. What is your favourite bun that is named after a place? <laughs> <laughs> is this a trick? No, there's a few. Is there? Yeah. Well, there's at least more. two. <laughs> yeah, there's, there's, there's loads. What is my favourite bun that's named... It's not loads. There are loads. There's not. Chelsea. Yeah. Bath. Mm-hmm. Bath bun? Yeah. That's not... Is that what it's called? Yeah. Okay. Uh, and... Belgian bum? Belgian bum? <laughs> What's your favourite bum then? <laughs> the Belgian bum is a good bum. The, the big full What's bum. What's the difference there. between a Belgian bum and a Chelsea bum? Uh, one's from Belgium. <laughs> There's the QPR bun that you can get in a uh, cafe near me. It's a Chelsea bun. And they call it a QPR bun because it's near QPR. Because Les Ferdinand likes them. <laughs> I um, Do you uh, like any buns named after I like places? Chelsea buns, yeah. but not because they're from Chelsea. No. I, I haven't had a Chelsea bun for a very long time. It was the sort of thing you'd go to the bakery in the morning on a Saturday yeah. in the 1950s. Yeah. But I did, it did used to happen where we would go and you could, get, yeah. you could choose a bun. Yeah. And I would choose a Chelsea bun. In fact, I think a Chelsea bun is an iced bun that's a Belgian bun. I'm glad we're... I mean, this is what yeah. I came for. <laughs> this, this kind of top-level banter. I want to know some other buns that are named after places. Have we got any other suggestions? Eccles cake. Eccles cake, that's right. That's good. Does Pont- that, what does that Pontefract count? cake. People don't know what that is, but it's, it's very far from being a bun. I would like... It's not even a cake. Well, if we're, if, if we're expanding the parameters yeah. to this extent, then can't I have a Viennese whirl? Yeah, you can. Okay, well, that's my favourite. Viennese whirl. I'll tell you what you can have. You can have a Viennese twirl. <laughs> that is, that's what it's called. That's what it's called if it's stuck up your ass. If I have to. <laughs> if you have to. <laughs> Would you like a Viennese twirl, man? I feel like if those are the demands of a kidnapper, that you could probably negotiate with that kidnapper <laughs> quite successfully. Like, I feel like... I think I'd almost breathe a sigh of relief if after kind of hours of tension and fear... It was revealed that that was what I had to. That was all I had to do. Was just put some chocolate in my bum hole. <laughs> I say, if it, if it's good enough for Marianne Faith, yeah. it's good enough. <laughs> so it wasn't in her bum hole, was it? But well, we don't know. Probably I don't want to intrude on her. <laughs> <laughs> right. I, they, I wanted to ask you about this because I didn't see this, but you were in Psycho Bitches. Yes. And you played both Medusa and Emily Bronte. Yes. To I'm, that's quite a uh, range. Yes. Thank you. I also played Diana Dawes. Did you? And Mary Shelley. Uh, yeah, it was good. I um, The producer of that, Ben Cavey, phoned me like years ago and said, I've got this idea to do historical figures, uh, female historical figures in a sketch show. Uh, do you think that's a good idea? And I said, I think that's a fucking brilliant idea. Uh, and uh, then, as is often the way in television, about four years passed. <laughs> <laughs> and then I got a call saying, yeah, it's going ahead, they're doing it. And it was really good. Yeah. They got so many amazing women. Like, it was just really nice. But a lot of us were doing just one individual sketches, so you'd kind of 
be kind of crossing paths across uh, like the outside area, you know, the production area uh, outside the studio with all these sort of Francis Barber going in and Michelle Gomez going in and Sharon Horgan going in and Julia Davis going in just individually. Yeah. Uh, it was just, it was really cool. Is Rebecca Front was the... Was the, the therapist, the therapist. Yeah, 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 yeah. It was really, really good. Cool. Yeah, it was great. I played Gertrude Jekyll. I often had to play ones that were noisy uh, and turned into werewolves. <laughs> <laughs> that was my, that's my USP, I think. Is this kind of, if you need someone, if in doubt, shout. Uh, get me. Uh, but uh, yeah, I had to play Diana Dawes as a, as a West Country woman obsessed with pork pies. Okay. Uh, and Emily Bronte as a tiny puppet, <clears throat> uh, which was a lot now of Now I'm interested. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and uh, yeah, and what was the other? Oh, Medusa, yeah. That yeah. Was, um, yeah, it was, it, was a good, it was a good two series. I think, you know, the trouble is, is obviously with those things, the, the joke lands based on people having a kind of top-line piece of knowledge about the famous person. Yeah, well, some of those are quite, I mean, not obscure, but quite Yeah, but well, the trouble is, is history being what it is, yeah. because of the patriarchy, Richard. Yeah. Uh, there are, you do actually yeah. run out of women who were famous enough, yeah. even throughout the whole of history. Was that because women weren't good enough in history? Is that, I mean, is that my fault? Well, that the women I'm not, I don't didn't do anything in history, yeah. apart from have snake in their hair, so that it didn't even happen? <laughs> Just sitting around <laughs> plaiting things and spinning and whinging. That's what women did in history, wasn't it? And then Lady Godiva. Yeah, Lady Godiva. Now we're talking. That was that was good. Um, I was only joking. I, women d- probably did most of the stuff in history. <laughs> you know, it, what would uh, Christopher Columbus do if his wife hadn't been doing the washing up? How would he have got across? Women have always played a very important, <laughs> supportive role throughout I history. I like the idea of Christopher Columbus' wife being on the ship. <laughs> We've still been all right, mate. It would have been okay. We probably had a bloke to do it downstairs. Yeah, we don't hear about him. I was... They've, they've turned against me now. <laughs> due to my inherent sexism. <laughs> if it's now wrong to be a sexist... What can you do? Well, I mean, you know... I don't know. Uh, the women have won. That's the thing. <laughs> that's the, the women have won. What we need now is, you know, men's rights. Yeah. Are you one of those? Yeah, Reddit? Absolutely. Are you one of those forum posters? I am. Yeah. For men's anonymous. Yeah. When will there be an international men's day? That's what I want to know. Yeah. <laughs> that's, what I, that's what I want to know. We'll find out one time. I applaud you every year, you. as most of the internet does, for your fine work <laughs> on in, n- telling people when international. I'm men's a very days. confusing figure. I've been <laughs> criticised by both anti-feminists and feminists for a lot of my work. So you know, I don't. But, you know, I don't need a whole room full of people giving me the silent treatment when I make a sexist comment. I've got my wife for that, all right? I've got my wife. Because I make many sexist comments. So it's more than, don't go, ooh, because it was, oh, fuck, fuck I've had enough of you. Can't wait for next week's audience. They're going to they're gonna get where I'm coming from. It's been lovely to talk to you, Katie. We've run out of time, um, unbelievably. I uh, haven't talked to you about... Nanny McPhee and no. all sorts of stuff. But we still found time for... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and when will there be <laughs> psycho wankers about men in yeah. history? When will that happen? I think, uh, I think you're proving the... Uh, <laughs> when, when will there be a sketch show with all men in it? That is, what, that, is what, that, is what, that is what we want to know. When will that happen? <laughs> then will justice will happen. finally be done. <laughs> It's been fantastic to talk to you. Ladies and gentlemen, it's Katie Brown. Thank you very much. You've been lovely. Come back next week. We'll have Julian Clary. Go and buy an emergency question book. Bye-bye. How do you like them sky potatoes? <laughs>